Okay, we're taking a look at the game Paths of Glory, designed by Ted Racer in 1991. And uh, Ted, I'm hope I'm uh, saying your name correctly. Now, this game is uh, one of my favorite on uh, World War One, and uh, it's gone through five printings. So this edition is the fifth edition, 2014. So we're talking about a game that's uh, what, like 17 years old and still going strong. It's a tournament at WBC and. Uh, is a popular one at that. Now uh, in a 20 minute video I can't possibly show you all the nuances of this game but uh, I'll try to show you the, the board, the pieces, the cards and we'll get an idea of what this uh, fascinating game is all about. Now it is a card driven game and um, one of the things the designer did was divide up each side's deck into three. And I thought it was a very uh, interesting idea to show you how the war progressed. Now I'm not showing you all of the cards here because I have a game in progress, but he's divided the um, deck into three sections. There's the mobilization deck, the limited war deck, and the total war deck. And that's the same goes for the central powers. Central powers in gray here, the uh, allied powers in red. And um, of course this is to give it historical flavor. All of the cards in the mobilization deck will tend to be events that happened in 1914. Limited War will be kind of 1915, 1916 to show you how the war escalated. And of course Total War gives you more cards and uh, more events. There's a mine of information on the cards. There's photographs, um, ops points, strategic movement, little asterisks to show that the card can only be used once. These are replacement uh, values. Of course, there's the text informing the player what the cards do. So it is very much a card-driven game. The cards drive the whole action on the board. And, um, yeah, it's uh, very good for that. One of the interesting cards in the game is the Guns of August card, which only the Central Powers player can use, and he often will decide to open the game with this card. It does count against his card hand, but uh, that's neither here nor there. It's usually the best card to open with. Um, as you can see, um, it's a powerful card because it causes the fort at Liège to be destroyed and you get to move uh, two armies, three armies actually, and activate them for combat. So um, it's often a good card to start the game. Since I've got the card uh, set up here, I might as well explain what the numbers mean. The three numbers for the operations points if you decide to uh, use it for such. Many games have that. The number beside four is if you want to strategically move units. That's moving units hundreds of miles via the rail network across friendly territory. Of course there's the event itself and if there's a little wee asterisk on the event it means the card can only be used once. In brackets there's another number and that's very interesting. That um, raises the uh, war commitment level of your side and uh, when you reach a certain level on the turn track or the general records track you go to the next war level. The game starts with mobilization but if you get to um, four that's limited war then you'll be using the next set of cards. Down here are the replacement values if you use the card to replace uh, units that have been uh, injured in combat. So that's a general comment on how the cards work. Now I'll try to show a very simple example of combat. And the combat is interesting. It's really on the core and army level. So uh, the, uh, the events are very overall. It's a very, very strategic game. Now in this example, we could have the 3rd Army German and the 10th Army activated. You'd need a, a 2 card to do so because you're activating two different spaces and since they're connected to the sedan they would attack and you would add your attack value 5 plus 5 is 10 and the French player would fire on the 3 table and you can see that there's a core table and an army firing table so in this case the German would fire on the 9 to 11 column and the French would fire on the 3 but it's more complicated than that depending on circumstances on the ground one of the rules I really like is uh, the pinning and outflanking maneuver. The German, in this case, can say that one army is pinning the third army 
and the other army is attempting to outflank it. He rolls a die, and if successful, the German gets to fire first on the army fire table, take the losses on the French, and then the fire, uh, French fire back. That's if the flank move is successful. If the flank move is unsuccessful, then the French player will fire first, inflict the losses on the German, and then the German will fire. And outflanking is optional. And there's other rules for um, negating flanks. For example, if there was a French army here at Cambrai, the 10th army could not outflank because he has a French army on his flank. So uh, there's a lot of little subtleties in the strategic combat, but um, that's what makes the game so charming. Now also on the board are forts. You can see them here at uh, Verdun and Nancy. They add in a little number here to the defense of the uh, army when fighting. And they also negate retreats if you have to retreat. Also forests help negate retreats too. There's a penalty. So if you're forced to retreat and you decide, no, I don't want to retreat, you can take a step loss instead. And the step losses are in increments, which is kind of neat. An army can take three step losses here before it's flipped over to its other side. It can take three more. And if it takes more losses, you can replace it with a core. And then the core can take one more loss. And on the flip side, one more loss, and then it would be finally destroyed. So it's an incremental uh, law system, very overall, like I said, army and core level, but it seems to work just fine. I find the combat system um, kind of elegant in this game. Now looking at the map, it's the grand, grand strategy of the war, so the board uh, stretches from France all the way to the east section uh, of Russia, not as far as Moscow, and of course Italy, Greece, and you get a whole map of the Middle East. That's almost a game within a game. And at first I was a little hesitant to um, use it much. I said, meh, kind of wish they'd left out the Middle East. But now that it's, I've got so used to the game, and once you get used to playing with the East map, you can't really live without it. Uh, it really does show that the East, Middle East, was, was important. And there's almost a whole game within a game there. There's just so much I can say about this game, I can't possibly cover it in 20 minutes. It's, it's just a, a wonderful game. You get the um, general records track, which keeps track of all your replacements by nationality. You move these up and down, and uh, you expend them to put cores in the reserve box. That will help you absorb casualties. Turn record here is generally August, September, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall so on. One thing I missed uh, when we were playing was a um, simple thing like the turn record track um, or the VP marker. Um, we couldn't find a blockade marker. Well, lo and behold, it's on the flip side of the VP marker. So once the Allies play the blockade marker, just remember to flip this over. Why is that important? Well, because every winter turn the Central Powers will lose one point. It's a point system game, so the um, Central Powers are trying to make points, get to 40 ideally, force an armistice, and the Allied player is uh, technically trying to get the Central Powers down to zero. There's a whole Russian capitulation track and a U.S. commitment track. Certain events have to happen with the cards for Russia to capitulate, and uh, my understanding from the game is that we don't often see Russia capitulate. Uh, it's a series of six steps to get the Russians to get knocked out, and that's not too likely in the game, but it could happen. It's a very wide open game. Some people have said that it really isn't World War I. I disagree. It's World War I, but a very open kind of World War I. There's a lot of what-ifs that could happen. You certainly can have a stalemate on the Western Front, as historically happened. Both sides could be here, entrenched to the gills, and nobody able to make any headway. So you can simulate World War I, but it's unlikely your game uh, will go exactly the way World War I went. Now, as with any CDG game, the cards are the game. I mean, these are just, they're great. They've got some really neat 
cards in here. I mean, there's your reinforcement cards, you know, Mata Hari, special events. It's the interaction of these cards that have made this game so successful. Some have called it one of the best war games ever. Um, it's certainly up there in my opinion. I think it might be in my kind of top five games of all time. Um, rules. The latest edition of the rules is 2010. Um, in 2014 they didn't need to uh, do a, no, a whole new rules booklet. The 2010 issue, which you can uh, uh, download off the net, is um, will bring you right up to date. Um, I, I, there's just so much to this game. Um, don't know what else to say. There's the mandated offensive rule, which is really cool. You roll for that every turn. And depending on what you roll here, your politicians decide that you have to attack. So if you roll, for example, uh, three, the British, means the British have to do some kind of an attack this turn, whether you like it or not. Now the Central Powers have the same idea. For example, if they rolled a three, Turkey would have to attack. AH, if they rolled one, Austro-Hungary would have to uh, make an attack. Um, so that's on your mind, too. Um, I just don't know what else to say about this game. If I have any nitpicking criticism of the game, it's uh, I give I score the game let's say nine out of ten. I would have liked the um, uh, strategy cards to have a few more naval events. The naval war is very important in World War One, though it is virtually ignored in this game. There's a Jutland card or a German high seas fleet card, and um, uh, of course, a card for the uh, British fleet, which more or less causes a one-point um, swing for each side. That's about all the naval you're going to get in there, although you can do naval moves from port to port. That's this kind of thing. But the naval war is left out in this. I just wish they had um, put a few more naval cards. I understand that there's a, an expansion with, uh, I think, 20 more cards. Uh, I don't know how you get it. I think it was only available in C3i magazine. But um, that's my last word on Paths to Glory. Uh, a very, very good game. If you're into World War I at all, this might very well be your cup of tea. Thank you for watching.